اوكي اقلب منين لا لا اوكي ستارت ويز دي صوره الدكتور ناجي الدكتور ناجي الدكتور ناجي دي الصوره ديت كانت في مؤتمر السنه الماضيه في راس البر دايما انا بيربطني بالدكتور ناجي كل ما حب فعلا احنا بنتعلم منها حاجات كتير قوي لان احنا محظوظين فعلا في واحد الكلى ان فيها ناس بهذه الكواليتي من الناحيه الانسانيه والبوزيتيف اتيتيود طبعا صديقي واخويا وحبيب الاستاذ دكتور علاء صبري طبعا عشره عمر طويله جدا ودكتور علاء يعني كنز موجود يعني اكاديميا وعلميا وكل شيء له الاحترام الشديد دكتوره غاده ان شاء الله امتداد للدكتور ناجي بنفس الانسانيه ونفس الذوق والمنتظرين منك الكثير ان شاء الله وطبعا الدكتور محمد كمال لو قعدت اشعر فيه بكره مش هو في حقه دايما بفتخر بهذه المجموعه كلها والصوره دي كانت في مؤتمر الجمعيه طبعا المؤتمر السنه دي له طعم خاص المؤتمر له طعم خاص وجزء من من الحاجه الجميله طبعا الدكتور عمرو الحسيني هو صديق واخ وعزيز وبفتخر بيه استاذ محترم جدا في جامعه في امريكا فده طبعا انت فخر لنا كلنا كونك ان انت عملت سيستر شيب مع الوحده هنا مع دكتوره غاده ومع دكتور علاء فده حاجه جميله جدا 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 اتمنى ان شاء الله ان تعم الفائده والناس كلها تستفيد من مجهوداتك ومن علمك واللي وصلت له. Today I'm going to speak about anemia management. So I start with introduction, pathogenesis, evaluation. Then pillars of management. I know Professor Okasha will speak about iron in breed dialysis. So I'm going to touch important points, not comprehensive for the iron. Then ESA therapy, high responsiveness and resistance, special issues. To start with, I like this uh, uh, topic, anemia, and uh, this is why I have many videos through the, the last five years. Uh, on the YouTube. Uh, to start with, definition of anemia, it's better to be concise, to look at hemoglobin. If hemoglobin is reduced below this threshold that you see in this slide, if we speak about adult male, if it is less than 13 gram per deciliter, or female, 12 gram per deciliter, it is anemia. Uh, anemia is important because anemia affects all the life. I consider Red cell is the coronary stone for oxygen. So each cell can suffer from uh, anemia. So anemia affects quality of life, reduce exercise, uh, capacity, cardiac output, angina, increasing angina, little bit of hypertrophy. So if we treat anemia, it is expected. Although Professor Nahas know that the evidence, there, there is no evidence-based medicine to confirm that if we, if we treat anemia, everything will improve, but definitely we learn it through the years that there are some symptoms in chronic kidney disease uh, are because of anemia. Even a stroke, if there is anemia, the risk of a stroke increases, especially if the hemoglobin is very low, we can uh, see hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, so the treating anemia, especially if it is uh, very evident, is crucial, it is beneficial, and has repercussion on the quality of life. Why anemia is there in chronic kidney disease? A lot of factors. All of us are aware by erythropoietin deficiency because kidney is the organ of secretion of erythropoietin. So if GFR is reduced below 60 milli per minute, erythropoietin uh, level is reduced. But it's not solo, uh, it's a deficiency. We, we should look at, I like this slide because it includes uh, modifiable risk factors, partially modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. So if we know that this is a modifiable risk factor, it's better to modify. So iron deficiency, folate deficiency, hypothyroidism, using medications, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and RBs, non-adherence to anemia management, all these factors should be addressed and uh, managed. Uh, potentially correctable infection, inflammation, under dialysis. So if we have a patient on dialysis and the dialysis is inadequate, there is no way to discuss ESA, iron. We should do our best to offer uh, good dialysis. Impossible to correct like uh, bone marrow, this, uh, fibrosis, infiltrations. In this scenarios, we uh, collaborate with hematology 
Sometimes we need blood transfusion for these cases. How to evaluate the patient with anemia? We should be uh, start with a good history, clinical examination, blood testing, including chemistries, uh, CBC, reticulocyte, ferritin transferrin saturation, ETC. So this is the classic. Uh, their guidelines, yes, there are many versions of the guidelines. The most updated guidelines was released from, uh, from uh, UK, uh, the Renal Association guidelines in 2017. So if we have a patient with chronic kidney disease, it is uh, advised to at least annually monitoring hemoglobin uh, for stage uh, th uh, three CKD at least twice or more if we are in stage four or five CKD. What about iron? I'm not going to discuss oral iron, but some important messages. Transferrin saturation percentage is more important than ferritin. In, uh, in predicting mortality, especially if it is very low, so transferrin saturation less than 10% is associated with higher mortality irrespective to the value of ferritin. The higher the ferritin, the higher the mortality, as shown from this study uh, in uh, United States, in Europe, in Japan. Ferritin, if it's above 800, 700, mortality is there. Through the last five decades, a lot of innovations in iron therapy, from iron to our, uh, oral iron, IV, then we are now in the era of dialysate iron uh, uh, supply, ferric biophosphate citrate. This, this slide shows treating iron with intravenous iron, intravenous iron is safe because there was a, a, a fear from oxidative stress infection from giving intravenous iron. This data assures the safety so long as we follow the standard of care of management by using intravenous iron. And here we have a good experience and we have published many papers about parenteral iron in dialysis. Uh, and we like iron saccharate because of the lack of uh, anaphylaxis. However, iron saccharate is not the optimal iron. Why? Because it's unstable and uh, reduces monocyte function and associated with oxidative stress. So iron sacrose and sodium ferric gluconate, both of them are red colored coated. This means there is a problem in the oxidative stress. The more uh, new introduced irons, like ferric carboxymaltose and iron isomaltosides are more superior regarding monocyte and oxidative stress. This is the study that introduced iron to uh, dialysate. So what is the philosophy of putting iron in dialysate? When I read it, and uh, I, I am interested in this issue because when we add iron to dialysate, there is gain 60 milligram per session. And it's near the physiological uh, domain. So by putting uh, iron in the dialysate, this will reduce the need for parenteral iron and it will reduce elemental iron in the blood with subsequent reduction of oxidative stress based on parenteral iron. So I think it is very nice. But the problem is, if we think of uh, by, uh, this form of ferric uh, citrate, biorophosphate citrate, it should be added to the fluid compartment of bicarbonate. So if you have capsule, it will be difficult to be used. And this is a study from pediatric group showing that this form, ferric biorophosphate, can even given, be given intravenous. So this is what we need from iron, is uh, to have ferritin in the range of 200 to 500, so long as I'm speaking about hemodialysis patients, and transferrin saturation above 20%. This is the pivotal trial design, and uh, this, is, this is the strategy. So what, uh, try, this study tried to answer the question, how much iron should be given to the patient? Should we be liberal or conservative? So we have two arms, either proactive iron given iron sacrose 400 milligram in a monthly uh, or reactive given iron only if ferritin is reduced below 200 
or transferrin below 20%. So these are two schools. To increase safety, if ferritin is increased above 700 in proactive, iron is was held. So we give iron proactive, re restricted by the level of ferritin. If above 700, we stop iron. And the results of this study was released this year. Uh, so we have 1,000 in each arm in the proactive and the reactive. And this study showed that uh, proactive is associated with uh, better iron. And more importantly, the outcome, primary outcome, and the composite in the points uh, are toward the in favor of proactive iron. So again, giving iron in the dose of the range of 400 milligram per month, provided that ferritin doesn't exceed 700, is the safest according to this uh, very interesting study. This is why they, they, think, they think it does pivotal trial will change the guidelines. Although the arm of uh, liberal iron, it is not liberal. It is restricted by dose and ferritin. So I consider it wise use of iron. This is why I agree about the editorial comments of this article. It is better to use iron in a wise manner. The patient who needs a lot of iron, th this patient will be associated with uh, uh, problems. And we can monitor iron. Uh, through, so, th so we can monitor iron in liver by using MRI. And we have MD thesis of Dr. Karim Nagati to measure in Dallas patients uh, iron uh, by MRI, and you are waiting the result of this study. Regarding ESA therapies, all of us are aware by the products of e erythrobiosis stimulating agents. We have ibutin alpha, beta, darbutin alpha, sera. I think they, they are uh, very nice uh, drugs. All of them uh, are, are good. And there is some difference, like the room temperature shelf, so erythrobiotin alpha, should be kept in the refrigerator. Uh, darb uh, butin beta can be left five days away, seven days for uh, darb butin alpha, for sera 31 days. So this is j to be put in mind when we prescribe these drugs. For short-acting butin, this is a standard starting dose, 50 to 100 units per kg, either intravenous or sub-Q, three times every week. Uh, darb butin alpha, 0.45 microgram per kg, as single intravenous or sub-Q once weekly for the starting uh, phase. Sera, 0.6 microgram per kg, administered uh, intravenous or sub-Q every two weeks. So uh, darb butin can be given uh, after, the, after the induction phase every two weeks and the sera every month. Again, uh, what, uh, th uh, the, the, this is the, this is the uh, Brit Renal Association guidelines recommended that the initial ESA dose should be determined by the patient's hemoglobin, the target hemoglobin level, and the observed rate of increase of hemoglobin. So if we start any one of these ESA therapies, and you'll find jump in hemoglobin, it's better to reduce the dose or even to stop ESA and to continue monitoring the patient. One of the most important questions, which ESA to be used, uh, there is evidence-based medicine towards superiority of any of them the, according to this systematic review and meta-analysis, meta this network meta-analysis published in Cochrane Review Group, including 56 studies, 15,000 patients, showing there is no superiority for any of them. So we can use any of them, so long as uh, they are available. And I like this statement of the guidelines. They recommend the decision on the choice of ESA is based on local availability of ESAs rather than any brand. Even, this is a good lesson, if we have a patient prior to dialysis, coronary kidney disease, we shouldn't be rushing in the treating by ESA therapies. Because if we are rushing, especially in diabetic coronary kidney disease, this may increase the risk of stroke rather than giving benefit to the patient. So before starting ESA therapies, we should have good history about previous history of thrombotic vascular events, history of seizures, Hypertension and controlled hypertension should be controlled first, and then we can use ESA therapies, uh, ATC, history of cancer. The question, uh, sub-Q or intravenous, 
according to this, this cohort from the United States for Ibutin uh, Alpha, they convert uh, 57,000 patients to 5,000 intravenous versus sub-Q, and they found the data is assuring. Sub-Q reduces the dose by 25%, and even the side effects is l less. So it's better to be given subcutaneous, especially here in our country with limited resources. Regarding hyper-responsiveness, it is a silly uh, issue because uh, the ESA therapy is expensive, and if we use bigger doses to reach certain level of hemoglobin, it will consume a lot of money. So if the dose exceeds 300 for a uh, unit per kg per week, it is considered as uh, resistance or a darb between above one point microgram per kg per week. And resistance may be primary and it may be secondary. And this is one of the recent articles documenting the relationship in Japan between ESA hyper responsiveness and the mortality. So it's bad news. In pediatric, it's, it seems that pediatric nephro uh, nephrology doctors are more smart than adults. So they have a in vitro test to test the responsiveness so they, uh, this, is ne this needs further study. One practical message. If we have patient on dialysis who was transplanted and resumed dialysis because of great failure, and he developed uh, anemia, uh, is a hyper-responsiveness, which we think of the graft, and uh, uh, assess C-reactive protein. If we find C-reactive protein is high, this means that the graft is the reason of inflammation, and we may think of uh, graft nephrectomy. And this is the lesson from this case. If we look at this case, and I'm not sure if you want to show it or not. Yes, it's show it. If we look at this case, here this is the starting dose of darbabutin, uh, around 40 microgram per week. Hemoglobin is fine. After a period of time, the patient developed uh, a resistance. So darbabutin increased from 40 up to 200 microgram, big dose. Hemoglobin even is reduced. And there was no improvement except after transplant nephrectomy. After graft nephrectomy, the patient, the dose again, uh, uh, it was reduced to the baseline 40 microgram, and hemoglobin is okay. So whenever we have prior graft, graft failure, uh, we shouldn't uh, forget this issue. One of important and one of the updated uh, uh, sectors within this presentation is hepcidin. Hepcidin is cytokine released from liver and it is uh, uh, introduced since 2001. And the hepcidin here in this cycle uh, uh, block ferroportin. Ferroportin is the transporter of iron. So uh, ferroportin is responsible about availability of iron from liver, from macrophage, to the circulation to be, bi to be bound to transferrin and to be available for estroblast. So what hepcidin d uh, do does it reduces the availability of iron from uh, the macrophage and from even the gut, and so it will lead to resistance. Uh, and this is uh, how to deal with hepcidin. We can deal with hepcidin because hepcidin is a marker of inflammation by improving dialysis, and this is one of the methods. So this is a study, crossover study, compared the tra traditional bicarbonate dialysis to hemodifiltration, and they found hemodifiltration online, high volume, is associated with significant reduction of hepcidin and the improving anemia management. Do we have uh, treatment in the pipelines? Yes, uh, the hepcidin cycle is uh, targeted by new molecules. So we have, these are two articles that are uh, very recently published, and this uh, shows two monoclonal, two monoclonal antibodies for the hepcidin pathway. So either this antibody, which is ferroportin antibody, binds to a ferroportin, because hepcidin, when it binds to a ferroportin, leads it to internalization of ferroportin and uh, leads to unavailability of iron. So if we use this antibody, it will bind to a ferroportin and prevent the binding of hepcidin to, its, to ferroportin. Uh, uh, and th another molecule binds to bone morphogenic protein which stimulates the gene for hepcidin release. So these are two monoclonal antibodies. They are tested in animal, and they moved to human in the phase one study. So we are waiting 
the results of further studies. The more practical, since many years, we have hypoxia in the superfactor stabilizers, brulide hydroxylase inhibitors, and as you see from this table, different names associated with reduction of hepcidin. And this is how uh, hypoxia and disciple factor stabilizer work by stability of hypoxia and disciple factor alpha to stimulate erythropoiesis. The question now, is there a difference between ESA therapy and hypoxia and disciple factor stabilizer? Yes, there is a difference. ESA are given parenterally. Hypoxia and disciple factor stabilizer are given orally. So this is maybe an advantage and it's advantage. But the, the problem is Hypoxia and disciple factor stabilizer are short-lived, so we are waiting the long-term follow-up, and the, we are afraid of uh, vascular and growth factor A stimulation because it may hit and hurt the retina. Another problem, we are afraid of cancer because hypoxia and disciple factor stabilizers may increase carcinogenesis and oncogenicity. This is why we are waiting the results of phase 3 Phase one and phase two are assuring, but we are uh, waiting phase three study. If you uh, are interested in hypoxia and disciple factor stabilizer, I think one of the best resources to be read is this article. It includes the names and the uh, number of patients study designed for phase three studies. All these are phase three studies, and they will be released either this year or next two years. So we are waiting plethora of phase three studies to prove uh, this issue. Another paradigm in ESA hyperresponsiveness is adiponectin. What is adiponectin? It is another cytokine that increases with reduction of GFR, and it may reflect expansion of fatty bone marrow, uh, and this will uh, be associated with uh, ESA hyperresponsiveness. Is there a link between statin and uh, hyperresponsiveness? This is a cohort of patients from China this is CKD patients treated with a statin, and they found that a statin may improve ESA resistance. So the dogma of a stopping a statin in CKD patients should be reviewed. Uh, regarding the variability, I don't like variability in anything. So it's better to keep hemoglobin undulating in narrow range by either having dedicated uh, uh, clinical pharmacist uh, anemia nurse, or even this is our job is to follow the serial reading uh, by avoiding variability. Because variability, even in pre-dialysis, is associated with the mortality after dialysis. So variability is bad. And we may even use artificial intelligence for complicated program. I don't advocate complicated program, but it's better to uh, keep eye on the serial uh, readings. What about cancer? Is ESA therapy uh, carcinogenic? This is one of the studies, uh, although it's not randomized control study, but uh, showed that higher doses of darbobutene exceeding 70 microgram may be associated with increased oncogenesis. So it's better not to give bigger dose from darbobutene or other uh, ESA therapies. What is the target? We are treating hemo low hemoglobin to reach what? Do we treat? Uh, hemoglobin or we treat a patient as Professor Nahas just mentioned in his elegant presentation we are treating a patient so we should individualize our treatment but we have guidelines uh, if uh, we treat to reach very high level of hemoglobin we may suspect the uh, cardiovascular mortality if we leave the patient anemic so uh, there is a lot of uh, comorbidities so the wisdom should be there this is the different guidelines, and as you see, for hemodialysis patients, above 10 to 12, this is a long range, and the, uh, between uh, 10 to 11, it is good, and it can be individualized according to old, young. And the question, if uh, hypoxia and disciple factor stabilizer will be established, at this level, is the same for uh, hypoxia and disciple factor stabilizer, I think it will be different, and it will need further studies. This is the current state in the in, in, in United States. In the mid-2000s, uh, uh, there was a trend toward giving a lot of uh, iron and ether therapies to reach higher hemoglobin for this category above 12. The, this category is very uh, big. 
But nowadays, the trend is to be more wise after the publication of three trial. And this is a situation in hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, a lot of uh, iron. It, the category of post-transplant anemia. Post-transplant, we have two publications in anemia management, post-transplantation, and we learned that anemia is associated with problem for the graft function. If the target hemoglobin is the same uh, in transplantation like hemodialysis, actually we don't know the evidence-based medicine, but this is one of the most recent studies showing that uh, targeting hemoglobin, post-transplant hemoglobin between 12.5 to 13.5 is superior regarding keeping graft function. So we are waiting further evidence from other studies. If we target higher hemoglobin, we will need bigger dose from ether therapy. The last point, blood transfusion. We hate blood transfusion and we should educate ourselves and our colleagues to avoid blood transfusion as we can because sometimes the condition is stated medical legal indication for blood transfusion. Uh, this is the guidelines recommending that patients with anemia of CKD, especially those who are waiting transplantation to avoid blood transfusion and this recommendation based on a strong level of evidence because we are afraid of sensitization. As I mentioned, we should avoid blood transfusion as we can because even in our state, there is a fraction of patients treated by blood transfusion because they, their situation needs blood transfusion, so about here in the range of 15%. This is one of the important resources to be read because this is the most updated guidelines for anemia management in CKD and dialysis. This is the renal association guidelines that was released in this journal in 29 pages. I recommend this uh, article and I'll end with this uh, beautiful uh, picture for this nephrology unit Mando. And this was a very nice day because this is the first time to find all members in a unit celebrating and tributing the professor uh, uh, as father and as uh, great brother. Thank you very much for your attention. Shukran uh, Hussain, it's really very interesting presentation. Do we have any questions or comments on uh, <coughs> Professor Hussain's presentation? Professor Tariq. What is the rate of IV iron? So, we measure, I, I, left, I left iron in this <coughs> to Professor Kamal Wakasha, but we measure both ferritin and transferrin saturation because it is inadequate to monitor only one of them. And in some, in the renal association mm -hmm. guidelines, mm -hmm. they even mention the hypochromic red cells. So if you have hypochromic red cell above 60%, ferritin less than 100 mm -hmm. microgram per liter, transferrin saturation less than uh, 20%, you are in absolute, the patient is in absolute iron deficiency. And this dictate giving the parental iron. In this scenario, we give, if, we, if we give iron saccharate, uh, we give 100 uh, uh, milligram every session for eight sessions, then we continue by the approach of monitoring ferritin to be below uh, 800. We don't like 800, above 800 or 700 according to the pivotal trial. I like it, so we can stop at 700. If you find ferritin 1,000 or more, you can discontinue iron for one month or a couple of months and to repeat iron indices. Regarding hemoglobin, if the hemoglobin is less than 10 gram per deciliter, so we start after replenishment of iron because one of the uh, uh, important inertia in the physician is to start ether therapy. Uh, starting ether therapy in iron depleting patient, this is a rushing attitude rushing. and should be uh, corrected. And this is one of the lessons from CME and from attending conference. We should correct first iron deficiency and then think of ether therapy. If you start ether therapy, if the hemoglobin is less than 10, and you'll find that the rate is half gram per week, it's good, <laughs> and to be monitored later on. Professor Hussain, concerning the, the statin, I think you said we should be very careful in stopping the statin. Uh, apart from the pressure of the uh, pharmaceutical company, I think statin has many uh, advantage, I mean in nephrology itself. And I think the guidelines are clear. We are not stopping. We are not stopping statin in those who are maintained on statin, okay. but we are not adding statin for patients who are not already on statin because 
most of the studies does not prove it will improve the morbidity or mortality, I mean the cardiovascular outcome in our patients. Thank you very much. Am I clear? Uh, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, I know the, uh, the most updated guidelines stated that 1A, not to be started if the patient is on dialysis, but if the patient is treated with uh, statin to keep. This was since 2012. Currently, there is some individualization. If you have a young patient in dialysis with high cardiovascular risk factor and the cardiologist perspectives in this state, the starting setting may be started. And you will be astonished in the, my coming presentation of uh, nephrology update, you will find that um, for the nephrology, for the kidney, the statin is not so friend. You may find some side effect renal dysfunction because of the statin. But statin is used mainly for the cardiovascular. So the dogma is to avoid the statin for dialysis patient is to be revised according to the individual base. But if we say in CME, yes, for dialysis, we don't start from our aspects statin, but uh, uh, we reserve it. Uh, graft failure, uh, instead of doing a graft infectomy, can we give a dose of high dose of corticosteroids, say 20 to 30? Uh, yes, you, you, you mentioned the how to treat graft intolerance syndrome. Graft intolerance syndrome means it's anemia. Yes, one of the manifestations of graft intolerance is to have resistant anemia. Yeah. So if usually we use a steroid if the if we have tender graft, if we have edematous graft, so we resume a steroid and we encounter the many cases uh, who stop the steroid abruptly and we resume a steroid and the, the symptoms improve. But regarding the anemia, if we, ha if we have no tenderness, no edema in the graft, and it is resistant to anemia, my opinion, although it, uh, Professor Ashraf may correct me, my opinion is to think of graft nephrectomy instead of giving steroid. Dr. Ashraf Rayaki. I think we should individualize our decision in such a situation because graft intolerance syndrome is not always associated with anemia. So the decision of adding the steroid is just to stabilize the patient and mostly if this recur, we will proceed for graft nephrectomy irrespective of anemia. I understood from Dr. Abdelbari that he is asking regarding About anemia. anemia. If graft we have resistance, uh, to uh, either, I don't think I don't have the uh, the answer, yes or no. I didn't. We but didn't try. Do you this. encourage the use of steroid for this uh, scenario, or do you no. think of graft nephrectomy is is a priority in this case? Resistant to anemia and graft failure. Uh, from now, I will try steroid because it is a good idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very, very much. It was a very actually uh, long session, but really we enjoyed that. We'll move to the next session. Thank you.